the main event, the reason you guys are all here tonight is that there's this Indy Young. And Indy Young uh, is, <laughs> is uh, a researcher that's been thinking a lot about uh, inclusive design. I think there's a book involved. Uh, and uh, so that's pretty cool. You'll raise up your book at some point. We can all go online and buy it to make you rich, I hope. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about um, universal design for a long time because uh, disabilities. And this is, um, I think that there's a lot more, um, it, it can get a, a broader um, than, than inclusive design and, and uh, universal design. And uh, well, let's let me let you take it away, Indy. I'm going to stop sh uh, sharing and let you uh, show your face and show your screens and whatever you'd like. Hey, and here I am. Am I live? You are. You are. Okay. Cool. Very good. Super excited to see everybody. Um, I am joined here today by my fur. Uh, child. <laughs> so if she um, if she interferes, we'll just all tell her hello. I think she's hungry, but I did feed her. So anyway, um, I did hold up the book. We just got the um, the translation to Brazilian Portuguese put out. So that was very exciting. And um, note that the color of the cover is the Brazilian flag. Yay. Uh, or demi progresso. We had fun because this is a self-published book, so we could do whatever the heck we wanted to, which was great. <laughs> so let me share my slides. And what I'm going to do is give you a visual and oral introduction or taste of, kind of what, um, what I'm focused on these days and what I hope that I can help you with. And can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, Very excellent. Good. Let us get started with more than enough of the gaps. Um, I wanna start off with this cute little post that Richard Banfield did uh, it's a couple months ago. And it starts out saying the tech bro blueprint for creating a product company. And he's got a list of 10 things. I'm just going to look at a couple of things. But one of them is uh, create a tech first solution in search of a market. Um, and we're getting a lot of this now with this AI stuff. Oh, yeah, exciting AI. AI wow, you know, it's the next big thing. Let's just, you know, make something and then see if we can figure out if we can solve something with it. And the second one was tell everyone you're going to make a dent in the universe. I especially love that little phrase. It's like, well, please don't dent my universe. <laughs> we have a bad enough time right now on this planet. But um, in any case, there are number six down here. There's this little funny thing about relying on the founder's vision to provide the direction of the product, of the solution, of whatever they're making, instead of doing any sort of discovery process. And I know a lot of the folks that I hear from are in a position, even if they're not at a small company where there's a little founder uh, doing things personally, they're in this position. So they often get uh, sort of blocked by this idea that um, profit is more important than the users. Uh, even this idea that marketing gets um, 10 or 100 times the amount of budget that research does or discovery does. And then the eighth and the ninth point that Richard makes here is that these founders tend to discourage teams from cross-pollinating, even like sharing knowledge or talking to one another. And in fact, they try to incent them to compete. And number nine is they're always focused on the OKRs, like how well are we achieving the little projects that we've set out for ourselves, these little goals. Um, and this is, you know, let's, let's keep rolling these features out. Let's launch these things. Let's get these things on. The race is on. And I want to quote unquote, keep the team inspired. The word inspired is code for um, hurrying. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is kind of like, mm, everybody's in a bad mood these days. There's been all these layoffs and it feels like a lot of it is because of this. 
Uh, Jared Spool has been talking a lot, and I have too, about we need discovery research. Jared's like, oh my God, it's the feature factory, um, you know, where people are designing wheels without knowing that it's going on a car or a baby carriage or whatever, right? Um, and so we've got this big, scary monster that we're facing. It feels like there is an actual enemy out there. And we talk a lot about this enemy and how to deal with this enemy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the brighter side of things. So this um, career eating enemy also could be seen as a world eating enemy with respect to AI. Um, it's not the whole picture. We've got a lot of really good stories out there. And I want to tell you a few of the good stories so that the monster is put back in its box. Uh, so I want to start off with a story uh, about a study that I did. It was actually in 2020. And I used an empirical method that I have created that's just as repeatable as doing big data quant stuff. It's just as empirical. It is not subjective. However, it is focused on people. It's not focused on the solutions that we're making. And I have an image at the bottom of the screen, which is, looks like a bunch of towers in a row. I'm going to get into that in a moment. So the study was all about understanding people's heads is all like, oh yeah, the typical founder, the typical founder has, you know, this idea that they don't want to work for anyone. They don't like anyone telling them what to do. They want to know everything from top to bottom of what's going on with the org. They want to be in control. And it's also about disrupting markets or disintermediating markets. It's about innovation. It's about maybe this idea of becoming famous, maybe this idea of doing something amazing that they will be remembered for, even if it's in just a small niche. Oh, and also this idea of maybe becoming rich. That's our idea. Okay. It's not the whole st story that the typical developer, um, the quote here is that I do this mostly for the tech challenge. It's hard. I want to solve it. And if I can, that makes me feel good. Uh, but it could also really help people. So a lot of um, the patterns are a little bit shaded toward help. And of course, we've got judgment in both of those particular understandings of founders and tech folks. So in this study, what I wanted to do was get an empirical understanding, which means I want to understand what the patterns are that exist out there. I don't want to invent categories um, based on certain things that we've heard, right? Or things that we believe. So I asked one germinal question and that question was, what has kept you up at night these past couple of months? What's been going through your mind? That resulted in one to two to three hour long conversations with these founders. That is the only question that I come to a listening session with. And what happened was, and I was actually surprised because this is a very broad question. We got patterns right away. And the patterns um, gave us a variety of mental spaces, things that people were thinking about, spending cognition on. And some of it had to do with maybe building the product the right way. Like there's a particular way to do it, or even just building the business the right way. These are, after all, entrepreneurs in this study, preventing the investors from changing my product, which apparently is a big fight that founders have, ensuring that everyone within my business feels good and safe working here. And that surprised me and work respectfully together. So what I have fuzzed out at the bottom, um, because I don't wanna show the actual data because it's private, it's those blue and purple boxes and pink boxes you can see in there. Mm -hmm. Little boxes actually contain the words that the person told me in a listening session. So that's why I'm fuzzing them out because I wanna keep those private, but, the patterns I can share a little bit of. 
Okay. I'm sure you all understand what we're doing here with respect to research. Those second two things in this particular list were really interesting. Ensure everyone feels good and safe working here. And work respectfully together. There was a lot of interior cognition being said about those things. Now, this is a screenshot of all of the mental spaces that resulted. Now, the mental spaces are patterns that uh, have emerged bottom up from the data, from the transcripts, and these are organized into towers. These kind of look like city skylines, and you can see three rows of them because it wraps. It's very long. They're quite long. Um, and one of the interesting things that happened was that neighborhoods came out of this. So if we think of this as a city skyline and those towers are buildings, the buildings are organized into blocks, city blocks. The blocks sometimes organize themselves into neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods that came out were start a business. How do I pull this thing together? How do I get it off the ground? What are the organizing principles? What governance do I want to put into place? Um, and at the other end of it, there was a lot of thinking around ending it. i have noticing the signs. Is there any way I can change this? Can I stop it from having to end or do I need to just end it? So there was a lot of thought around that. And then in the middle there, there was this stuff like ensure pride and dignity in our work was one of the neighborhoods that what I just showed you bubbled up into. There was more in that neighborhood, but ensuring pride and dignity in our work was top of mind and keeping these founders up at night. Another one was arrange funding. And of course, that's gonna keep you up at night. And as I, I kind of have this pink scribble behind all these little things, because as you're thinking about arranging funding, you can recognize, oh, yeah, people go and get funding in a variety of ways, and then they have to go and get more funding later. So you can tell that this is not a sequence of steps. These are just headspaces. These are areas that someone is doing some cognition about, and they might return to that cognition over and over. Okay, there was one other neighborhood, and that's called Shape Myself into a Better Founder. That included things like, you know, how am I going to shift myself from this role of founder into the role of CEO? And what do I take with me and what do I leave behind? It included all sorts of interesting things that aren't in our typical monster enemy kind of understanding of who a founder is. That was really fabulous to find. <laughs> but of course the monster comes back in our minds because like, oh, well, who hired you to do this study? Who has the time for that? Who has the budget for that? Who's gonna do it, right? No one's going to do this kind of thing because we're all in a hurry or I'm under a time constraint or my boss just wants me to get this thing done so I can, you know, check off that OKR. Um, oftentimes your bosses are asking these questions about let's just build some information. We just need a little bit of information. Erica Hall refers to it as just enough information, and I agree, we only need just enough information, but sometimes the enough information that we need needs depth. Oftentimes, you will get your managers or their bosses saying, let's just do a quick survey, just ask some questions. And the problem with the survey that we all know is that the survey represents the survey writer's life experience or view of the world or the organization's understanding of the world, or they're looking at the world through the lens of their solution. So everything that's in the survey answers that they expect you to answer may not match at all the way that you think. And if your answer isn't in their answer set, and you just keep checking other, 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 your data is an outlier and it gets tossed. And by tossing the data, they're only verifying or validating their own worldview. Okay, we all know this. We understand this. It's quite clear, but it's not clear to other folks. And our job is to help 
make the decision when just enough research needs more depth. When it does, the only way to understand that depth is to do some interviews. They, I've got some jobs to be done interviews, plain old interviews, site visits. All of these involve the messy business of listening to folks or writing back and forth with them or texting with them or trying to understand what their interior cognition is. Oftentimes, interviews don't have any sort of structure. And you're kind of wandering in the forest. And so I have uh, a method called listening sessions that has a very structured way of doing this that involves no list of interview questions. So you're all like, how can that be structured? Anyway, what's well, interesting that came out of that research that I did about the founders was this idea of thinking styles. Thinking styles is my word for archetypes. Archetypes are at the base of characters that you might use in scenarios. Uh, these archetypes represented, one of them, our monster. Our monster is represented by this one in the middle. It's called Seize the Opportunity. It's like, hey, I just want to start my own business, do my own things. So I can make my own decisions, right? I'm driven to do something that's going to alleviate a pain point for a person, which starts making it sound a little bit more human, interestingly. But look at these other thinking styles. Off to the right, uh, there's one a thinking style that's called humane, sustainable, and still successful. Despite what others think, we can actually run a sustainable business as an ethical entity and also make money. <laughs> so um, there's another one down at the bottom called Next Huge Radical Change. This is the founder that has one idea that is going to change the world. And they are so, ah, I guess, excited or supportive of making this positive change that they will put everything they can into making sure it launches. So a couple of the founders that I did listening sessions with had gone through a couple of failed uh, projects of failed companies. Um, they failed for one reason or another, like a design issue that they didn't anticipate or a person comes along and org comes along and wants to buy them, but it's a match where the design doesn't work because of a law. Um, so there's all this kind of like, detail -y stuff, but they're like, okay, yeah, that died. It's too bad it died. I'm going to try something else. Whereas the next huge radical change, if that project dies, this person will have some serious therapy to go through. <laughs> um, anyway, what's fun though, hours to lose and twist my PhD into a business. Um, those are two other Thinking styles, what's fun is to recognize that the monster does not exist in all of them. So let's take a look at some successes. I want to give us some positive stories. And I have here a list of things that I wrote about when I was trying to explore what the difference was between discovery research or research that's going to affect an organization's strategy versus the research that affects the solutions that we're trying to make or the research that helps inform your organization about the market. There are certain questions that are asked in those other two types of research that are different than these questions. So these questions are about strategy. They don't get asked that often, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples where they are being asked. So one of the questions is, how do we measure improvements in how people or communities address their purpose their way? How do we support communities? How do we have impact? How do we make positive in outcomes? Josh Seiden has a book out about this, right? So that's a question. Another question is, where are the gaps or harms in existing solutions that we can address. Might be our solutions, might be a competitor solutions, but what can we address here? And along those lines of competition, how can we find a wedge in our competition's market or how can they find a wedge in our market 
I don't think a lot of people ask that second part, um, which is like, let's, let's find a defense <laughs> before our competition gets there. Number four is related to number two, what variety of solutions can we start out filling in, fill in these gaps and extend our reach? Where are the ways that we can do this? I'm going to give you some examples. And then the fifth question is, how can we refocus on long lasting and sustainable support for people and profit for us so that we can keep going supporting people? Not everybody, as we saw on the last screen, is out to just flip their business and make themselves into a billionaire. So let's take a look at number three. I want to look at the second part of that, which is like, how can we wedge into somebody else's market? And there were uh, a couple of founders I talked to where they saw that the competition in a particular market was very predatory. It was costing people who were poor to begin with a lot of money. Um, the the industry was remittance and they're like hey we can do better we can do something where it costs less for people and take away those predatory businesses their those primary predators take away some of their business right so this was what they were trying to do um i want to point out though before i go do because a lot of these are going to go outside of tech. Um, we've got the technologist founder, we've got um, biotech, right? Um, so there's technology really strongly embedded in the Bay Area, but there's also a lot of other organizations embedded in the Bay Area. So you'll get to see a couple of those in the examples. They're working to bring um, sort of this support, but also ethical support and sustainable support to people. So next question, how do we measure the improvements in how people or communities address their purpose their way? And I want to define something for you first. I use this word purpose. Uh, it doesn't have to be used. I use it intentionally because I want to move away from the word goal, but you can use whatever word works for you in your situation. Um, everything that I say, I ask people to adapt to their own context. So I use the word purpose intentionally to just sort of like put a little point on it. It's like, yeah, it's somebody's intent. It's their objective. It's their goal. It's their job. If you're talking about jobs to be done. Um, but it could be something that might take a decade to complete or a lifetime to complete. It might be something that only takes an hour to complete. It's maybe something that they're only making incremental progress on, and that's fine. It might be something that they're hesitating about waffling over or even procrastinating. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to avoid that. Okay. So that counts as a purpose. That's how I define it. It's from a person's point of view, it has nothing to do with a solution. In fact, a person uses many solutions to address their purpose. Uh, what I have on the screen here is an image, a little icon of a person helping someone who is having trouble walking. And the whole study here was about people who were taking care of a parent specifically, who had some sort of surgery that um, put them in bed for a while. Okay, so this is going to take a couple of months of recovery. And you, as one of the children involved, um, are taking on a, a caretaker role. And I wanted to know what went through your mind as you did this. Okay. One of the things is that people have a lot of approaches. There's a lot of different aspects of taking care of a parent. Um, that may not have anything to do with tech, uh, but maybe it can be solved by tech. Who knows? And so we're looking outside of the solution. An org might have a particular solution that they're interested in, but we're going to look outside of it. Okay. 
Um, there's also various thinking styles that come up. I already showed you some thinking styles of the founders. And here you might imagine that a caretaker could have a thinking style of like, I'm going to, you know, try to treat my parent with a lot of dignity, or you might have a thinking style of, ah, we have this, um, relationship that's a little fraught. And so I'm going to take the least amount of care <laughs> as I can get away with. But what's interesting is that that can change your mindset, your thinking style can change based on context. Okay. So there might be a day where you're like, yeah, I'm giving you a lot of dignity. And there might be something that happens and you're going through a day or two where like, I'm giving you the least amount <laughs> that I can get away with. So the question, the number one question that we were just looking at in that list was restated. How do we measure the value that we're making for people or for the community? If we're trying to help people who are caretakers, how do we measure that? We've got to measure it against what people are doing to accomplish or address their purpose. If we don't measure it against that, then we're not getting any understanding of it. Um, so I want to jump out again and define this word value, um, because value is one of those words that you hear a lot, but it means a lot of different things to different people. So you could think of value as, hey, the person has had success addressing their purpose, but to make it also valuable to your org, not only does the person have to have success addressing their purpose, but it has to be sort of a leveled up success that they would be willing to pay for. Okay, does that make sense? Pay doesn't necessarily mean money. It could be uh, paid for in terms of time or paid for in terms of uh, wisdom exchange or investment or an, another kind of labor. There's a lot of ways to pay. But that leveled up thing is part of value. Value can't just mean, oh, look, they successfully did the thing that they were intending to do. And again, the thing that they were intending to do is their purpose is not use a button on your solution. Okay. So oftentimes in tech, you will hear people define leveling up as, oh, we made it faster, or we made it easier for you to do it, or we allowed you to do it at scale or do it more efficiently. Those are basically the four things that tech loves to claim as value, as that leveled up value that people are willing to pay for. But we can measure it in more nuanced ways, in ways that are contextual to what the person's trying to get done. So if you're a caretaker taking care of your parent, one of the things you might be doing is trying to avoid certain emotional triggers. And if whatever solution, you're reaching for is going to cause these emotional triggers, you're going to let go of that solution. That is not valuable to you. Okay. If what you reach for allows you, like before it was always emotionally triggering and there's this new solution out there and all of a sudden you can get done the thing you want to get done without triggering emotions. Wow. Yes. I would be willing to pay for that. Right. Uh, so not triggering emotions is one of the ways that we can define leveling up value. Um, it doesn't interrupt their flow. It doesn't take extra time. Um, it doesn't require them to provide unpaid labor. Uh, it helps them support someone or makes room for something else that they needed to do, or it's less stressful. There's a lot of different ways. And we take these ways of measuring from that data. We understand it because it shows up in those little boxes in those towers. Okay, so a lot of user experience folks are talking about being able to support the person or support the community. Sarah Fatala here I have on the right hand side of the screen, she was presenting at Rosenfeld Media Advancing Research this spring. And she's talking about all the different ways that orgs like fail or achieve this ability to actually work and collaborate with the community or let community 
um, like support a community solving its problems. Jennifer Frazier was talking in a different, uh, same, same conference, but in a different way about trying to understand or take a step back to understand what's the system. If we can understand the system um, by looking at it in different ways, then how do we bridge between our understanding, like the understanding I'm building of the nuances of what might be a way to level up a value? You know, how do we connect those two? How do we connect value to understanding? So the orgs that are asking this question, I promise you this, one of them is called the ICA Fund based out of Oakland. They're supporting people of color who start small businesses. There's a greater percentage of people of color starting small businesses than people who are white. And there is a lot of activity in this area. They are uh, quite the... Um, <laughs> quite the supporter uh, of local businesses, local small businesses. You might want to check them out. Diana Tremblay was like point blank. I really want to understand the value we're creating for these people and be able to measure our improvement of that value and maybe find other ways to provide value. And we're not necessarily saying it's easier and faster, right? Flip Cause is another one, Emerson Raven. They are helping nonprofits, also nonprofits with started by people of color, um, have easier access to funding or have easier access to the the, the sort of governance and the um, structure that they need to create their nonprofit and to run their nonprofit. The Hivery is a small business that was started by Grace Cravinger, and she's trying to make a place for uh, women, and she's trying not to be gender specific, but a place for women who have not had access to being able to start a business, have access to one another, access to one another's ideas, and support to start their own small businesses, often in tech. Um, so those are some examples, and all of them are talking about, hey, you know, we're, we can do this sustainably, we can do this ethically, and we can still make money. We're interested in supporting people. So that's number one. Let's look at numbers two and four, because they're pretty related. I'm going to give you some more examples there, which is where are the gaps, or could we say harms, in the existing solutions that we can address? And how do we start filling these gaps to extend our reach, maybe within a market or maybe to another market that we didn't realize we had? Oftentimes, it's within a market, um, a, a section of the market that we just totally ignored, didn't realize existed. So the orgs asking this question are a little bit more familiar. Um, lots of insurance companies are asking this question. I have no idea why. Lots of finance companies are asking this question. I do know why. Lots of healthcare companies are asking this question. I've got stories about insurance and finance. Lots of universities. I have some stories there. And government as well. How do we understand what we're doing well for people and what we're not doing well for people? And how can we begin to start to make some differences? So in insurance, Nina Bianco is working at USAA, um, going out and doing one of these studies for one division of USAA having some success there, helping them identify what the gaps are. And then when some other division of USAA starts hearing about that story, about how they're using that data, they ask Nina also for a study. The same is happening down in universities at University of Buffalo with Rebecca Bernstein. She's like, I know I'm, I can't go around to all the parts of the university and try to persuade them to do this. So I'm just going to work with the people who are interested in asking this question. We're going to have some success. And that success, those stories, that's going to get around. And other people are going to come ask me to do a study like this. Um, Philip Brashear at the Kentucky Consortium of Technical and um, 
uh, colleges in Kentucky uh, was also doing this sort of work. Um, in the insurance area, Donald Cox was also doing this sort of work within a division of a uh, insurance company interested in supporting small businesses, like small, like you're going to be doing a gym uh, in this town in the next town over, or you're opening a window washing company or something like that, or a facials uh, little salon. So it's areas where they're like, okay, I sense there might be a gap here, but we've always thought we had it covered. Let's go find out what the nuances are. And let's be specific about what those nuances are. So we're not just like trying to think of a technical solution and then hope that maybe there's a problem out there that it solves. Um, in the government area, the UK Home Office, at last I talked to them, they had like hired 100 researchers, which was amazing. <laughs> um, but Craig Duncan at the United Nations also did a number of these studies. One of them was uh, Prevention Web, which was about helping people within cities globally prevent the damage that happens like when an earthquake comes. So what stories can you share with each other about preventing the worst? Um, here actually is a printout of one of his uh, city skyline diagrams. Um, they're also referred to as opportunity maps or mental model diagrams. Again, I don't care what words we're using. Maybe I should because I don't mark it well enough. I need a word, but um, <laughs> use what works within your org. And what I want to do is kind of dive into one of these. We've looked at a couple of them. What I've got up on the screen here is one that we did where we were trying to understand everything that went through someone's mind um, as they were doing something that required a lot of self-confidence or required building a lot of self-confidence. And what you see here are different colors across the screen, different sizes. Um, those are all each a different neighborhood. The, when I introduce these things, we start at the top down, but these are built, they bubble up they're from the bottom up. So that we're representing emergent data. If we zoom in, you can see one of these neighborhoods in green, and you can begin to see that there's four different blocks within that neighborhood, like if it was a city, right? And each of those blocks has a number of towers. The first block actually is pretty big. It has a lot of towers in it. Um, and if we zoom in again, you can see that first block has what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight towers in it. Um, you, in the second block, you can see three towers. I've got a little label with three arrows pointing to it. There's the third block, the fourth block. The first one, um, this whole neighborhood is a neighborhood that's about try to master the change. Um, what they were doing was uh, changing something about themselves that requires self-confidence. Um, and the first block is about master the skills and experience I will need. The second is try new experiences and cultures. The third is reach out to people. The fourth block is about work at getting accepted. These are all bubbling up from what the towers are about. And the towers are all bubbling up from what has been said by people inside those boxes. Okay. I have no idea what neighborhoods are going to come up. I have no idea what the towers are going to be or what the city blocks are going to be. This is emergent data. Here's another example. This happens to be an example uh, from, and this one's on my website, so you can actually download it and really zero in and read all the data in there, uh, from a group that was supporting employers who were required to hire people with disabilities. And the second neighborhood in there, the orange one, is about recruiting people with disabilities. Uh, the second one, the green one, is about managing uh, those people with disabilities. And um, here, we're going to look at that again a little bit later. This is another, um, I think I showed this to you already, the idea that, yeah, what I want to show you on this slide is that below each of these towers, we have aligned the organization's capabilities. And by aligning those things by the towers, rather than looking by features, so you might have one feature repeated underneath a couple of different towers. 
we can start to see how strong or weak that feature is for that particular tower. It might not have a tower that it supports strongly, and we can also see a lot of gaps. There are towers in there that we are not supporting. Maybe that's fine. Um, so that's what we're seeing here is that all that empty space in the basements below those towers in the city skyline is where we put, and this was via sticky note on mural, um, all the capabilities. And then we got to assess what the gaps are. So I want to introduce one other thing before I go into looking at those gaps, because we want to be able to measure them in a certain way. And oftentimes the gaps might have a feature there, but the feature doesn't do a great job. And I want to be able to have a level. And so what I did was I came up with these four different levels of harm. Now, the first level of harm is the kind of harm that we are used to looking at and seeing in our usability kind of work. And that's called mild harm. We're causing someone annoyance or frustration. Um, maybe we're pestering them. And that's the kind of stuff that we tend to clean up when we're doing our cycles with our prototypes before we launch them, or you know, maybe something has already been launched. The next layer or level of harm is called serious harm. This is where we've had an interruption. We've wasted some of that person's time. Maybe we've given them misleading information accidentally or on purpose. Maybe we've caused them an emotional trigger or we've shamed them, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe we cause them self-doubt. These are not typically things that we measure. Okay, we as researchers are aware of them when we're doing some of this usability research, but we're not reporting them. The next level of harm is lasting harm. <laughs> lasting harm is like serious harm that went really wrong. So like I actually lost some work or some productivity. Um, I maybe lost some money or I lost a relationship or some of my reputation. Maybe I was vilified. Maybe I was threatened. Maybe I was actually injured. So this is lasting harm. And I know we've all heard the podcasts where they describe someone's experience losing reputation or being vilified on social media. Um, there's also another level, which is called systemic. And that is the inequality that we see built into our world, into our laws, inequality of housing, of opportunity, of salary, of arrest rates, all of that. So serious or lasting harm often gets built into our systems and becomes systemic harm. So this is the uh, scale that I have. And Lisa Dance also has uh, different categories of harm. She and I are working together on trying to come up with a way of talking about this. So this is a work in progress. If you're interested, let me know, let us know. Um, one of the things that she's interested in is this idea of unpaid labor. Um, and this idea also that companies are so, uh, they, they're interested in doing things fast and easy and cheap. And so they're hardened, in her words, against human intervention. And so this is how some of our approaches become severe or even become systemic. It's like, ah, let's just, you know, put it in the algorithm. <laughs> and so this is where we end up having to battle the system. And that's where the unpaid labor comes from. Okay, so this is what we are having a conversation about. Now, let's take a look at those levels of harm as measured against these towers. So I have on this screen a, an opportunity map, a city skyline, with those capabilities in the basement underneath those towers and with gaps showing, um, and an arrow pointing to some of the towers that are turned a little bit darker red. Those towers are repeated at the bottom of this diagram as different levels of harm. Uh, it's super tiny font, um, but what's happening is that we've got some dots above these towers that are lining up on the severe layer of harm, the severe level. Um, if you go 
over, we've repeated another tower. It's not quite dark, as dark a red, and its dot is at the mild level of harm. So what we're doing here is we're giving us a chance to have conversations with our org about strategically where do we want to prioritize? Where shall we go first? You have a larger strategy at your org. We're not just going to knock these things off in order left to right. We're going to prioritize and we're going to go forward with some of these that we're interested in. And then over time, we're going to move those little red dots up into the support <laughs> level, hopefully. This happens to be a mental model diagram about cotton farming. And this was done by someone in Australia, where the government keeps sending people out with surveys to understand what cotton farmers need. And the cotton farmers are so frustrated that they don't want to talk to the government people anymore because the surveys have nothing to do with what they're staying up at night thinking about. And so this was an opportunity for those cotton farmers to really tell a researcher about the things that concern them. We've got some red towers here that I initially talked about, like feel irritated that I must take the tech's work in my own hands, feel frustrated when the tech leaves me stranded, and feel burdened by the extra work I need to do because the tech failed me. And so these are some areas that maybe as an organization, <laughs> we may want to focus. This is an opportunity. Okay, we can measure some of the nuances here about how we can improve this better than just doing faster or easier. Here, we're going back to the mental model diagram or opportunity map about employers and disability in the workplace. And we were looking at recruiting for open positions. And this particular set of towers that I have circled here doesn't have a lot of capabilities in the basement underneath those particular towers. They are about, well, where the heck do I find people who are disabled? You know, that whole argument about the pipeline, right? So what's happening here is that we have also measured what's going on for people beneath each tower. Here, um, it actually expands out. It's not as narrow as the towers. Um, but what's happening is that we've got a bunch of little letters in here that refer to capabilities in the works or competitors' capabilities that we ought to be able to do just as well. Um, and a lot of them are in the lasting and systemic harm layer. There's this one tower that's uh, about attending job fairs and people who are disabled are not at the job fairs. So well, what do I do? <laughs> well, there you have a systemic harm. How can we work with other people to understand the improvement of job fairs? How do we work with other people to understand what do people with disabilities need in order to connect with the employers? Let's look at it from that point of view instead of like the solution job fair. Okay, so one of the interesting things here, and on this screen, I actually have three different city skylines, three different um, opportunity maps. Um, in different sections of the screen with little fat lines between them. And what I'm trying to do is say, hey, you know what? One org, if it's big enough, is going to have different purposes that it supports. And remember, the city skyline is about understanding a person's approach to the purpose. So that means they're going to have different cities. And often these are really large orgs with divisions that never talk to each other. And you're always pulling your hair out because you're like, hey, I've got this new intern or I've got this new recruit onboarding. And they're asking me questions that I should know the answers to, like the history of what happened, you know, four years ago. Uh, I, I can't tell you because I wasn't here four years ago and I have no idea who might have done that because I don't have any visibility into those other divisions. What I'm suggesting is that these city skylines represent 
the skeleton, the structure, the bone structure of a person's approach to the purpose of these purposes, right? And we can start to hang that data or archive that data off of those and see into each other divisions, neighborhoods that might be similar to our neighborhood. I've got a couple of arrows like between the orange neighborhoods in two of these cities and the purple neighborhoods between two of these cities. And so this is an analogy of let's look at the way that we are collecting understanding about people, perhaps archive it within the structure of these cities and introduce people to what the other divisions know about neighborhoods that are similar to the neighborhoods in our own city so we can maybe share. Okay, talking about this uh, with really large companies gets people very excited. So the, the analogy here is that if you are a business unit, you are not a city. You are a cloud over the landscape and you cast a shadow over a city. So you might say the city is mine, but you, your cloud might cover a bit of neighborhood in another city that's similar to your neighborhood. Okay, your, your understanding of things would really help another one of those business units, another one of those clouds that's casting a shadow. And now you can start to identify each other and maybe start having conversations, which would be really great. Um, and um, especially with the amount and speed of which our people working on knowledge building changes, it's really important to be able to understand what we already did and what we already knew so we don't have to go do that again. That saves us a heck of a lot of time. Okay, so on to the last question, which is how can we refocus on long lasting and sustainable support for people and profit for us? But this is that idea of that one thinking style in the founder say is like, yeah, you know, <laughs> despite what everybody says, we can do it. Um, and there are lots of people who influence us in UX talking about this. On the right, I have a little screenshot from Dr. Brene Brown, where she's talking about leadership and thinking about leadership as power over people or power with or to or within people, within groups and communities, and how to work with that. I've got on the right, Deirdre Barber and Maureen Benson, who are talking about transmuting white supremacy and patriarchy and comparing it to dismantling. And what does that look like? And what are those mindsets like? It's an act of being, it's more fluid. It starts with I, it's less like me versus them and you're doing it wrong and you're this enemy monster. <laughs> There's a mindset shift also toward becoming co-owners. We're collaborating. We're co-owners across business units, but we might also be co-owners with the people that we're supporting. So there's a lot of community collectivism. There's a lot of cooperatives um, being talked about. There's also Indigenous leaders teaching us about the idea that ownership is a very white or colonial type of thing, and why not try thinking about um, co-ownership, right? Not, not, not this is a resource that I own, but it's something that lives on in its own right. So the orgs that are asking this fifth question are orgs like the Business Council on Climate Change. Mara McKnight has founded that. There's also Mike Montiero and Erica Hall at Mule Design asking that question within our own user experience field. Um, the idea of like working to maybe uh, avoid compressing wealth in, into people who already have wealth in a cap capitalistic system. Like there's a lot of work going on outside our field that's interested in this. And it corresponds to that fifth question. So our monster <laughs> uh, needs to be put in its box. Yes, it lives in the back of your mind. Yes, your monster is saying that won't ever happen. 
Maybe it won't happen in our lifetime. But this has been a thing that has been trying to come out across humanity for hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, we see this idea of having the solution space being the only place where we're allowed to focus. Um, we're crossing out the idea of discovery research. We're crossing out even the idea of bringing anything into the strategy space besides the the founder's, you know, vision. <laughs> But that isn't necessarily true. I showed you that. There are other thinking styles. There are other approaches. There are other organizations who are asking these questions. So um, that's basically what I wanted to talk about uh, today. But what I want to mention is that um, I've got some courses and a book about how to understand someone in a structured sort of way. It's called a listening session. And um, I showed you the book already about that. There's also a course I'm going to be doing a live practice series on, on listening deeply in November. Um, but just to give you a little taste, because everybody loves a little taste, um, the idea of understanding people comes down to the topics that they bring up. It doesn't come down to them as a personality. Um, oftentimes we make the mistake of thinking of we're going to understand the way someone ticks like we understand them by their horoscope or we understand them by their Myers-Briggs letters. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is we're understanding each topic that they're bringing up, and we're trying to go into the core of that topic. On the screen, I have the topics represented as like a little jawbreaker candy, where there's different layers of candy, and at the center is the core interior cognition. An interior cognition is someone's inner thinking, their emotional reactions, and their guiding principles. And that's what we're interested in, and we're we're going to go move through the other layers that exist in that topic, which is explanations about, you know, how it's done, why it's done, statements of fact, opinions about it, preferences around it. We're going to move through those layers to get to the core, interior cognition. And we're going to do this focused on just a person's purpose. So we're trying to come to someone with a particular purpose they have actually been doing a lot of thinking about. I do intro sessions with people before every listening session, a couple days before, to make sure that this is something they want to talk about, to make sure that they've done a lot of thinking about this. It's also something that forms a really nice warm connection so that the person feels a little bit more safe with you. Um, that's about the recruiting. I talk about recruiting in the book as well. And then this whole idea of qualitative data synthesis. It's not a top-down thing. It's a bottom-up thing. It's all about patterns. We all know qualitative data is about patterns, but we sometimes end up being asked for insights, and those insights show up as like a little anecdotal story that's not a pattern, or that's something that resonated with us because of something in our own lives, but we didn't wait to see if it became a pattern. So I teach a cor two courses actually about this. Um, and that is the idea that when we are understanding people at this deeper layer, we can, we can create better solutions for them. But besides solutions, we can also use this to help our own organization, uh, especially with customer service and sales, but with marketing. Um, I've done studies with people in human resources to understand thinking styles around employees. I've done it several times. Um, it helps with corporate governance if you're trying to build this in as a mindset shift. Um, and company culture. Remember there was that whole thing in the founder's mental model diagram about making a great place to work, a place where I feel ethical and safe. And so this works. Um, so yeah, the single most supportive shift that you can help your organization make is 
to move from only thinking about people through this solution that you're making toward thinking about people in relationship to their own purpose and their own approach to their purpose. And this is something you can actually apply to some of the other research you're doing and a lot of the design that you're doing. Um, so the other thing that it works really well for, this is my last slide, is building relationships. Uh, listening deeply is a great way to recognize the humanity in your coworkers and your management and build relationships with them. Not only does that help you understand one another uh, and maybe communicate at a deeper level, communicate at that interior cognition layer rather than at your opinion layer, but it also helps you find funding, <laughs> which is really nice. So that's it. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's any discussion to be had. And I'm going to remove your spotlight. Oh, look at how dark it got to be in my little space here. Um, and I'm going to invite everybody to raise your hand and ask a question. But I'm going to ask a question first, if you don't mind, Indy. And that is, this is uh, partly about that big stage of taking all those quotes and affinitizing them and turning them into towers or valleys or neighborhoods or different neighborhoods and so on. Do you do that on your own or do you do, you do that as an exercise in conjunction with your client? Because I've uh, done it both ways. Both ways. Yeah, both ways. Oftentimes um, the client will want, will have a team that wants to learn how. And I- okay. I guide them through that. Now that uh, it's a little bit different because I have these amazing courses where I am going to start asking my client to send their team through the course and then we will work together because um, there is a certain footing that is a little slippery when you first start out. And if you are a team member who's being asked by your boss, like just, you know, work with Indy on this and your footing feels a little slippery, it is not, um, it's not a great experience. I've seen a lot of people sort of drop off and drop out of the team because it doesn't feel as confidence building as it should be. And so in that case, I would like folks to be able to have that confidence and that can be done through the courses really easily. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers what you were really getting at though. I've worked with a lot of teams where um, we did several of these studies back to back and we got really good. And then people rolled off into another company and new people came on. And so we were like, all of us now starting to build their yep. confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Let me invite other people to raise hands or jump in. Let's not all talk at once though. I mean, I have another comment, but I don't need to be the one talking all the time. Sorry. I didn't introduce myself. That wasn't very nice. I'm Nancy Frischberg. I'm one of the co-chairs for programs and I, it was I who invited Indy to come and join us tonight after her two prior Bake High experiences, which were not in the monthly program meeting, but were in some of these special side groups. And we invite anybody who wants to, to revive the BOPs, the birds of a feather group, or start a new one yourself if you think there's going to be a lot of interest in it. So uh, Indy spoke to the uh, design thinking group and to the interaction design BOP, I believe design research and then the interaction design. So that was very fun, but th that was ages ago. So everybody understands everything she said and you're gonna go right out tomorrow and put it into practice, right? I'm hoping one of the things was that, that I could give a little sense of positivity, especially ooh, these days when a lot of people have been laid off or a lot of people are talking about being tied to their agile or lean process. Did that, did I manage? I'm waiting for somebody else to speak. 
I have a question, um, Andy. Susan, please. Yeah. Um, first of all, this is really, really interesting stuff. And I guess my question is, um, like, with it, when you're getting clients for this work, like, who's instigating this? Mm, that's a really good question. There, uh, <laughs> I I have a number of different stories. They instigate at a num in a number of different ways. Uh, usually, it's someone with one of those questions, or a couple of people with one of those questions. Often, they don't have budget or they don't have decision-making power for budget. And what they do is one of a number of strategies to build relationships with people who do have budget, find where the budget goes, um, and do it that way. I talked a little bit about uh, Rebecca Bernstein at University of Buffalo, kind of, she, she was working with one team who had this question, did this, and there was so much success around it that another team came and asked her to do it. And it started growing from there. Same with Nina Bianca at USAA. So um, there's also consultants who use this when the client comes to them with the client's question and the consultant's like, you know, we we actually need a little bit more depth here. Would you be interested in trying to find that extra depth? Is that something that interests you? I'm willing to wait another number of months while you and I together go into your procurement process to try to figure out how to get this done. Um, and there's also been a number of people who bring it from one organization to the next when they move jobs. Okay, Ted. Yeah, just uh, just a side question. Um, you use a you know these these this this visualization with the cityscape, and um, I just would like you to, to talk about different kinds of visualization or presentation approaches for presenting this kind of organizational structure information to people, and what has not worked, what has worked, uh, or what do you you know what do you encourage us to think about? relative to uh, that that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, generally speaking, we never work with it in its large format. It's too big. Um, it's fun to wrap a room with it. It's fun to wow people. I've ha had a number of people tell me, oh, and then, you know, the client came in or the the you know, architect or, you know, the product manager came in and is like, whoo, his eyes bugged out and wanted to know about this. But generally speaking, you always just zero in on a couple of towers. You're only really working with a couple of towers at once. Um, I have seen people work with this printed out. I have seen people work with this on um, online, you know, Mural, Miro, those kinds of boards. Um, I've seen people build these out of sticky notes um, and have like a room full of sticky notes and people go, what's that movie called The Brilliant Mind or whatever it was? Um, <laughs> it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So but, the question I can, can you, a uh, follow up question is, can you give us, um, you know, maybe, maybe you feel like you have it, you know, I just like to hear it again. Um, give us a, a really simple example that made a difference. Um, that surprised you or delighted you based on a very, you know, s simplifying the story for them with these, with these, uh, with, with a couple of towers. One, one of the things that happened was a woman named Arietta Sapanakis, who is a consultant in Australia. She and her partner got called into ANZ Bank um, in an emergency because the bank had hired another consultancy to do something, I think, that had something to do with um, interaction design of some facilities on their website. And what happened was she was able to, from all of the knowledge that was already there, that this other consultancy had built, first of all, she realized the other consultancy kept losing people and bringing new ones on. And so they built the same knowledge over and over again. So she took that knowledge, put it into the city skyline format. 
And she's like, right away, I can see exactly where they got stuck. This is why the consulting firm never made it forward. Um, And I think it was like three or six weeks later, they came up with a brand new design that solved everything that the, I think the consultancy had been working for eight months or nine months on already. So that was a big win. One of the things that happened in that win though, was that the um, system architect came into the room, looked at that city skyline as I like, oh, this matches exactly with what I need to know in terms of architecting the system. So you have it all laid out for me. The same thing happened with, I might not get this right, somebody in content. I can't remember the story really well, but that person who was doing something about content came in and realized that um, in this one section, there were a couple of different tones to be taken because to take care of the different thinking styles, they needed to be addressed in different ways. So rather than having just one solution um, for that one set of towers, it was three different solutions based on different tones or different sort of steps that a person needed to take to feel confident when they're addressing their purpose. So that was pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. Next. I have a quick question, if I may. Please, more of Please a message, David. If that's okay. Hi. Um, thank you for this. It was lovely. Um, toward the end of your talk, Indy, you had, if I, if I heard you correctly, you had said that this work is exclusively bottom-up. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Is it which sounds to me like grounded theory. Mm -hmm. So when you're surfacing, so after your first sweep of the data, am I to understand that you're not doing successive sweeps or any thematic analysis later on? No, it is. It's similar to grounded theory, but not exactly. There's right now, having just given this talk, my brain is just like on, and I can't think of the name of the other approach that's popular in academic circles that it's, maybe it is thematic analysis. I think it is closer to thematic analysis than grounded theory, but it's not either of them. So So with with grounded theory obviously being the bottom up and thematic analysis being an example of top down. Right, yeah, it's what I'm trying to do is get away from representing people based on a researcher or an org's understanding of the world. I'm trying to get away, especially from the, because we tend to go so fast, we, we, everyone who's involved in an organization who's trying to build a solution, um, tend to make demographic assumptions about people oh, you're an old person, so that means you can't use tech very well, right? I mean, that's probably not very common anymore, but, (laughs) (laughs) right? So the, the idea is to allow for completely different concepts to come up than what we anticipated. That's the whole point of it. And so, for example, with those founders, we came at it and I was trying to sort of do this presage, this in the beginning was that we have ideas about founders. Um, And if you're not a founder um, and you're doing this research, your own ideas about founders are gonna influence the way that you see things, the questions that you ask, especially if you're coming up with interview questions, they're gonna, it's gonna get shaded in there. And so I don't have interview questions. I just have this one germinal question. I ask people the germinal question. And because we've had an intro session where I'm like, hey, are you okay telling me your story? You're gonna lead this. 
Okay. This is not the typical call and response kind of an interview. <laughs> this is a, we're telling, you're telling me your stories from the past. We're going to try to keep it memory mode. We're going to bounce into session mode every once in a while where we're both like talking to each other about the session, but we're going to keep that short. And we're going to go back to memory mode about what went through your mind as you were addressing that. And my job as a listener is to help you unfold that interior cognition layer. So as you're telling me about what went through your mind, you're going to tell me, like, you know, you're going to set the scene. You're going to tell me explanations about things. You're going to tell me your opinions about things, your preferences around them. All of those are, are about that particular topic, not what I'm interested in. I'm going to keep helping you try to unfold actually what went through your mind. It might be an emotion. It might be some thinking. But generally what's happening is that this is something in the past far enough that if you are the type of person who doesn't, like isn't aware in the moment of what's going through your mind, which a lot of people are not, you have had some time. This is in the past. You've had some time to forge an understanding of what went through your mind. And because we've had a list, uh, an intro session, you've had a little chance of time to go like, okay, well, how would I explain that to this person? How would I explain my memory of what went through my mind? Um, this generally happens verbally, but it can also happen via text. I've had people draw things for me. There's all sorts of ways to communicate what went through your mind. Um, there's also this idea that people are only going to tell you what they remember and what they remember is what's important for them, what stood out for them. That's what I'm interested in for my organization. And so I'm not going to force them to tell me things that they may not remember because then they'll have that sort of relationship with me. Like, oh, she's asking me for this thing. I need to give it to her. Um, I'm going to invent what it was. Certainly. And then you yeah. don't want to prime them to even misremember yeah. something. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. So the whole, the whole synthesis part is just continuing that line. May I ask a follow-up? Yeah, sure. And then I'll leave you all alone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that makes a world of sense. And I find it interesting that you would stop after or pause at least after a bottom-up um, phase. Also, if I'm not mistaken, as a debiasing technique, right? Because once you start analyzing or going top-down, and as we, as we try to be responsible researchers, we try to acknowledge and mitigate bias wherever we can, and you know as well as anyone about observer effects, evaluator effects, that sort of thing, and so to even remove that entirely from the um, synthesis equation sounds like a nice thing, actually. <laughs> so yeah, I guess my final curiosity is about, is the question of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I, how, I'm sensing you going that direction. I'm already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, how much mm -hmm. interpretation are yeah. you applying or are you like active consciously resisting interpreting and just letting the raw data speak for itself and yeah, yeah. Try, so trying yes but one of the methods that i use is that i do this with a team right so we are when we're looking for the patterns coming together we're going back to look at how that was interpreted so there, there's a two-step synthesis process like most analysis where the first step is we're forming a puzzle piece out of a concept and in the second step, we're putting those puzzle pieces together. We're, we're looking to see what the patterns are. Um, but some of the time, those puzzle pieces aren't really great. And so we'll go back as we're working with them and together try to, you know, like re-understand what that person was trying to say. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes that's just not in the data. We could maybe go back and contact that person about it. Um, but sometimes we just have to drop it. Yeah. So, yeah, but that, but yeah, I was sensing you going there. I'm like a big part of this is being able to have a team working together on it. Um, I've had teams where we were in such different time zones that we couldn't actually work on it 
um, synchronously. So we leave each other notes um, and, you know, do what we can do. <laughs> um, was I that obvious? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I I I have gotten a lot of questions about it, so I sensed which direction it was going to go. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of that. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pausing in case there are more questions people have been hesitant to ask, but now would be a great time. I have one. Uh, this is Jennifer, Jennifer Taylor. Hi, Great. and I apologize I don't have video on, but um, indeed something I, I think about with your work on mental models is how it differentiates from many of the traditional ways that we learn to map out experiences chronologically. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, you know, to hear a little bit about how you've worked with groups that maybe have traditionally been approaching it from a journey mapping perspective as their bread and butter. Like, what are some of the surprises and benefits you've observed when groups introduce mental models as another way to map out experiences? Yeah. So, like I said in that second to last slide, it's like the most important thing that you can that you can give as value to your org in order for your org to give as value to people is this idea of understanding them from their own perspective, addressing their own purpose. So this, um, I just, I'm in the middle of finishing up the lessons on my course, uh, the second part where I'm putting the puzzle pieces together. And this idea of sequence is so ingrained in research that we tend to want to put things in chronolo chronological order. The point of looking for patterns based on someone's focus of mental attention is to step away from that sequence thing, step away from the nouns, because um, sometimes we, we noun tag things, um, and just look at what was that person focused on? What was that higher up next thing the person was focused on? And try to see the affinities based on that focus of mental attention, which then allows us when we're seeing that whole city skyline it allows us to notice that people think about some things very heavily and then when we take our journey map we can decorate our journey map with those focuses of mental attention look in the beginning here they're focused on this heavily but look they do it again here and again there and again there it's the same focus of mental attention even though it happens in different places in the journey, which means, ta-da, we can solve for the focus of mental attention or that sub-tower within it instead of solving for each step where it appears in the journey map, which is very exciting to team members when they realize that. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the things. That was a really good question. Thanks. And that resonates a lot. I mean, I, I think it helps earth experience principles that can be repurposed and helps define those design patterns. So I appreciate what you shared. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, it's just a, such a, <laughs> such a fun way, such a like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a structure. It's a thing. You can just like hold on to it right there. No sequence. Okay, great. Then over here, there's a sequence and that's just so clarifying for teams. Um, it's also super clarifying to be able to measure against the focus of mental attention, which is what I'm trying to do with those charts and the harm levels and stuff like that. And then that means the harm isn't necessarily done at a particular point in the product uh, journey, the journey map, right? But done when the person's in a particular focus of mental attention, which just makes it more clear. So I want to come back to something that you put into your abstract and I haven't heard you refer to again. And that is <laughs> at some previous Bakai talk that somebody used a term that inspired you for this. Can you remember what that term was or who was talking? You know, it was somebody from Stanford. I think it was in like 92. 90. You could easily look it up. Yeah, go ahead. I tried. I tried looking it up. Okay. Um, and that person had like... It was 
it was something completely different. It was like the structure of the different layers of an interface. And at the very bottom, I think they had something like maybe the word Adam or maybe the word task or maybe the word, you know, something in there. And I'm like, hmm. At the time, I think just after that, I was working with Visa, um, the credit card company, uh, trying to revamp the way that their um, reps handled Visa 911 calls. And uh -huh. uh, I did not have this practice, but I had that little idea. It's like, huh, you know what? Let me go listen to all these reps, right? Let me understand how they currently support people out there in the field who have lost their traveler's checks. <laughs> Um, okay, it was the 90s, uh, and, and sometimes their cards. And um, and let me understand how they interact with each other and interact with that person. Part of what they were doing was getting up and walking down the aisle and looking at a an atlas to see where in the city they might be able to deliver the replacement travelers checks, like to a hotel or to a bank or where, where would be a secure place to deliver those replacements and th they would also talk to one another like you had somebody in this little town where did you send it right and so i made a um a state diagram <laughs> out of it a state diagram is supposed to represent the parts of a system of uh algorithms of software right but i did it in terms of what people were trying to get done to support other people um and that was the very beginning it was based on that little thing at the bottom it might have been the word task or object or atom or something. And that was, I just like, okay, I don't have any other tools, so I'll use the state diagram. And then it all grew from there. So thank you, Baikai and that person. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked at 91, 92, and I'm not sure. Okay, maybe 93. Been, yeah. But well, you, you can go back and look at that. Okay. okay, I'll send you the. So everybody should know that we have the catalog of all the past meetings. Let me put it into the chat here and so you can look back and oh, see the goody. many the what do we call it the uh many different topics the potpourri of topics yes. that we undertake at bank high and uh some other chapters of the hci the computer human interaction group of the regional chapters have a different system so that they have a theme through the whole year it might be storytelling it might be games it might be something else and we have generally practiced the potpourri method of uh you know potluck see what's good this week and let's just dig in well indy it's been delightful thank you for entertaining us this evening and helping us think about some new ways of interacting with the people that are hiring us to be able to find out what they really need help with and i think that the um the the city metaphor neighborhood metaphor is very powerful and and helpful to a lot of people so great stuff come again to bake high please and i hope <laughs> that a lot of people get in touch with you to get your help and sign up for courses soon yay Bye. thank you so much nancy for inviting me to speak this has been a real pleasure Good. and makes me happy to give back <laughs> thank you so much okay We'll see you next bat time, next bat station. Sorry, that's a little American reference. But uh, the second Tuesday of next month is our next meeting, and that's the one that's going to be a hybrid meeting. Uh, we'll be physically together, and we will still be streaming onto various places. And uh, then there's some meeting in September that I haven't heard the topic for yet. October, we're going to do a memorial for Richard Anderson. And November, did she leave already? I'm hoping that Mary Parks, who was here earlier, will help me put that program together. Okay, see you next time.